Forest Travelers. Welcome back to Tales from the Enchanted Forest, the podcast where we bring you myths, fairy tales, legends, folk tales, and so much more. We are your hosts, Fox and Sparrow. Hiya, travelers. We are so glad to have you back. And this week, we're going to shake things up a bit. So normally we should start off by talking a little bit about the story, which we'll still do before we get started. But we just have found that over the years of doing this, that we should have like a lot we want to talk about. Um, so we're just going to start with a bit more of a free form uh, this week and just kind of test out to see, uh, test out a new format, see how we feel about it. Um, so we're just going to kind of catch up first because, you know, it's been a long time since I've gotten to talk to Fox. Um, so we're just going to catch up a bit on some of the stuff we're, we're up to and what we've been uh, reading or like watching recently. So, uh, Fox, Fox, any, have you read anything interesting lately or seen any good new shows or what, what's happened with you? So I'm actually really excited to talk about this because I have been reading a lot more. Um, and one of the stories, or I guess books that I've been listening to, and if you know me at all, you know that I am very, very picky about my audiobooks. I hate certain types of voices, and this is going to sound awful, but <laughs> I will listen to the sample of an audiobook, and then sometimes my brain just goes immediately, no, no, we're not, no, we don't like this. That's fair. Not to discredit, like, you know, any voice actors or narrators who do this kind of stuff, but I just have, I'm so picky with my audiobooks that I can only listen to I guess dynamic voices Mm -hmm. so not like robotic ones if that makes sense it's also kind of like when you're picking up a manga part of it is the story but also part is if you like the art style if you don't like the art style you're not going to enjoy it as much it's nothing against the artist or creator like it might still be good it just isn't working for you you know yeah, a hundred percent. I like that's what I do with manga as well. If I see a manga or even a webtoon and the art isn't in a style that I appreciate, I just I can't do it. Yeah. So there has been an audiobook that was recommended to me actually by my husband and brother in law. And it's called He Who Fights with Monsters. I was very hesitant to read this at first because it's kind of marketed as a lit RPG. Um <laughs> so literary rpg or like a light rpg but it's kind of a story where the main character so jason asano he's teleported to this different world and he has to kind of interact with it and figure out one where he is what he's doing but it's really interesting in the fact that it's i don't want to give away too much but it's so much like like a fantasy like a high fantasy story it's definitely not a young adult fantasy story but it's high fantasy in that he's in this completely different realm but it takes place with lots of really cool almost sci-fi elements to it where it's steampunky but there's this element of otherworldness to it but the technology is high tech it's fantastic it makes sense for the time and because he's from earth he makes lots of references to things on earth and pop culture and the people in this new world have no idea what he's talking about half the time but the thing i like the most about having you know an action adventure uh, almost fantasy fighting fantastical creatures kind of thing i like how everyone acts in a logical way we talk about (laughs) tropes so much on this podcast and people act in crazy ways sometimes in young adult even fantasy novels crime novels mystery novels i feel like in so many books people act in a way that has you questioning who they are like oh my god you're supposed to be this world-class assassin and yet you don't notice someone coming up behind you who's just a regular (laughs) person i feel like red flags so what i really like about this and what i would recommend it to everyone is just because it's it makes sense like people do satisfying things people react the way that a normal person would react or the person with their like from their class or from their rank or their power level would react Mm -hmm. and so it's quite satisfying to read because you start off and you go i hate this person or wow this person's acting like a complete uh can't swear this person's acting you know this a certain way and everyone gets the satisfying you know power-ups or development and it's just such a good good story to listen to but my favorite another favorite thing because i already said my favorite part is like the satisfying thing 
is the voice actor mm. or the narrator audiobook narrator i don't actually know what you call people who narrate audiobooks the storyteller the storyteller i guess he is so good he has different voices the intonation the australian accent so highly recommend it to everyone and especially for fans of things like D&D or Critical Role. It very much feels like that while still being a story. Nice. So I feel like it's a good bridge between not cause I can't really listen to Critical Role. I think it's a bit <laughs> too too much for me. It's not um, for everyone. But I know people who do well, I do I know people who really like listening to D D and listening to other people play it. So this felt like a really good in between for people like me who like D D and who like these kind of action adventures, but I never I, I can never just sit there and listen to like critical role or listen to um any kind of Dungeons and Dragons long form content. But I can listen to audiobooks and I can listen to stories, and this just felt like that to me. There are lots of little things like world building elements or little tech things. Even, I don't want to give away too much, but the main character, there are lots of things that he has um, that I just keep thinking, oh my God, I have to tell Sparrow about this. And I'm like, no, I can't tell Sparrow <laughs> about this because then Sparrow won't listen or read the book. But definitely recommend listening to it, not reading it, because the way it's presented is so nice like this this narrator cannot speak highly enough about him he is such a good narrator it's so immersive and maybe it's the fact that you know the main character is australian and he's australian like, narrator is australian that i'm like oh, immersive but yes that's <laughs> what i've been listening to and so i've had to clean my entire apartment go on walks cook basically do things that because i can't i'm not one of those people that can listen to something and then also multitask with another intensive thing so my apartment's really clean because i've been going through all eight of the books wow slowly. okay and i know you generally have a clean apartment to begin with you like cleaning so <laughs> i would love to see how clean it is right now i'll have to check it out one of these days yes please do and then we can talk about it basically i want people to read the things i'm reading so i can talk to them about it it's my favorite <laughs> thing after i read something i always go look for like either reddit or instagram or something yeah. just to see you know what the other people other people are saying it's it's nice so what have you been up to recently oh gosh I know you've been I'm... sick for a bit so you must uh, yeah I, I was something. sick i was sick earlier in the month i'm doing okay now um, trying to decide on what to talk about. I feel like I have three things going at the moment. Um, I'll talk about the, the main thing. Right now, what I'm doing whenever I have free time is I've been playing um, a new video game that came out earlier. Well, t came out really in August uh, called Baldur's Gate 3. Continuing with the D&D. &D. about it. Yes. And it is good. I have really been enjoying it. I'm only in Act 1. Uh, but I have been really, I'm, it's been a slow going because anytime I want to pick it up, I want to like have at least a couple hours dedicated to it if I can, or want at least one hour because it's hard just to pick up for like a couple minutes and then go. Um, mm -hmm. but like the storytelling so far is really interesting. Every one of my companion characters have had really interesting backstories. Um, and it's been like this big thing of trying to earn their approval and wanting to like be on their side and make sure like that we're we're friends. At least for me, I'm playing. I play classic good. I don't. I know I always have the option in these games to play the evil choice and do bad things, but I never have as much fun with that. I'm always like, I just want people to like me. <laughs> I just want, it's because want to they do always make you face the consequences. If there were no consequences to my evil, I would be evil in every book, or sorry, not every book, in every um game. But there's always like people run away from you and people don't like you and they say mean things to you back and I can't handle that. I'm like, I need people to like me. I'm a people pleaser, even in this alternate gaming universe. Yeah, but there's one character, like I'm doing everything that's like good. Like if someone needs rescuing, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go rescue. And there's like two characters, like one always and then another one flip flops. I can't just figure out what triggers her yet. But at least t two will be like, oh, you're going to go every way to help this person. And they disapprove of me. And I'm like, no, but Gail approves of no, me. She like thinks me. I'm doing a good job. Guys, what's wrong? See consequences. Yeah. Baldur's Gate is actually a game that I've 
I've seen so much about and I'm very, very interested. Yeah, it like, is. Hesitantly interested, but I'm very interested. It is D&D video gamified and it's done a very mm. good job so far. Um, I'm also, when I play D&D with my friends, I'm always the DM. So the big selling point yeah. of this is that I actually oh. get to create a character. <laughs> You get to actually play. I get to actually play. I'm playing a sorcerer, uh, which is fun. Uh, get to kind of play with the meta magic. Yeah. Anyways, if you like D&D, this is a very good game. Or if you like just real uh, role-playing games in general, you're going to really enjoy this game. It, it's very fleshed out, and there's just so much you can do with it. Um, it's still going, getting a lot of patches, which it kind of needs. It's still kind of a buggy game, but it's, mm-hmm. it's been a lot of fun so far. Um, so if you got like, you know, fifty to a hundred hours to kill at least, then this is definitely <laughs> a great game. Highly recommend. See, one thing that I have to ask though is because I know the one that came out is Baldur's Gate three. Yes. Are they connected? Like, are the previous ball like? Do you have to play the previous ones? Should you play the previous ones to enjoy this one? Or ah, gl- so glad you asked. I have no idea. <laughs> i literally uh just uh just picked it up and play started playing it i normally do like to get like the background lore on this type of thing but because i was Mm -hmm. kind of creating a new character anyways like i have to create one from scratch there's a part of me that didn't care about the background like so in my head i have my own background for my character and like i know because she was customized and everything she's not a part of whatever previous existing lore there is so i'm like well she wouldn't know what's going on like she's not really concerned with all of this so in my own head she doesn't know so there's no reason for me to know um probably we'll do the deep dives after i finish my first run through because i will absolutely come back later okay. to play like a monk or a ranger or something i get to finally play classes it's so exciting see what i like about that as well now that you've mentioned it it seems like you can play it through and then play again and have a completely different experience is what it sounds yeah. like. Now, knowing how I will play, I will absolutely be like, this character is going to be evil. I'm going to make all the bad choices. And the moment someone asks me a question, I'll be like, yes, let's do the right thing. So I'll probably have similar playthroughs because it's just me. But I will have absolutely the option to start being a jerk second playthrough and have a completely different storyline play out and different like endings and everything. Hmm. I like that. I'll go back to my my Stardew Valley for now, until I no, can get. No, absolutely. Until I can um, figure out what to because I always hesitate to jump into things like that where I'm going to be obsessed for a bit. No, it's fair. Specifically, when I know that more like I'm going to be quite busy, so I'll put it on my list though because that sounds really fun. Yes, also, I've and heard lots of good things about this vampire. Ooh, Asterian. Yes, uh, I know. Pretty much everyone I know is like, yeah. I want to I wanna romance him. Uh, he, when I first met him, we didn't have a good interaction because uh, he's one of those characters, if I do something good, he just, like, disapproves of me. So we haven't gotten along too well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying really hard to be his friend, but it, he's making it difficult. <laughs> See, I, I'm very excited about that because I like that trope of you know, the guys that don't like you back or the guys that, this is so toxic, but the guys that are so mean to you at first and then they become nicer, specifically in books, not in real life, let's be honest. Um, yeah, real so life that won't kind fly. Of like, ooh, I want to have to work for it. I want you to be mean to me before you're nice to me because I feel like it's, it, it makes me feel like I've earned it or I'm special in a game. You know, like those, well, you, you know what I'm talking about? Those characters... Well, you know those characters like in video games or whatever that are at first they're quite rude to you and then as you do more quests with them or as you get to know them better they soften up and then you're like oh is he opening up or is she opening up they are and then it's like it's that moment well i won't say much more because i don't want to spoil anything if you do get to play we could also um we could team up together we could have the we could play together so that would be fun (gasps) yeah you can team up with a party of up to four that sounds good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that is what we are currently up to. Um, I am currently obsessed with He Who Fights with Monsters. Sparrow is currently into Baldur's Gate 3. Yeah. And 
we will probably continue sharing some more about our obsessions that are vaguely, I guess, folklore related, related, fantasy related, Um, but just a little bit about our lives. We like getting obsessed with things and we just want to share that sometimes. And we usually have tried in the past to like weave it into the story in some ways and sometimes it's been more awkward than others. So we're just like, what if we just (laughs) told you what we're currently obsessed with and then we moved on with the story. But also... This is just us talking about things we want to talk about anyway, so might as well add in more things we want to talk about. Yeah. And what we want to talk about this week is folklore stories uh, from Nigeria. And specifically, we're going to talk about some animal tales. We've done animal tales before. Uh, Specifically, a while ago, we had an animal tales episode that was all about Filipino animal tales. So this time, Mm -hmm. we were like... Let's do talk about more animals, but let's pick another area. And we went with Nigeria this time. I think animal tales are always quite fun. And it's always interesting to delve into different cultures and different kind of regions to see what the animal tales are and how they differ and kind of what they explain. Because a lot of these animal tales are sometimes explanatory or they give a reason for something. So why does the elephant have a trunk or something like that? And... I quite like them because I think they're fun, they're short, they're memorable, and at the end of it, you're left with more questions than answers, but you do have (laughs) a definite answer of, ah, the elephant got its trunk because a different animal grabbed it and pulled or got stuck somewhere. And then also seeing the variety and seeing how different cultures and different areas explain similar things. Um, And we do touch upon that quite a lot in like creation stories. And when we did, I think, the rainbow serpent from Australia versus the Turtle Island story from Northern um, North America. So Mm -hmm. I think these are quite fun. And we've done a lot of princess stories, prince stories. So it's nice to have a mix up and shake it up. So without further ado, dear travelers, relax as we tell you the story of the election of the king bird. There was once a king of Calabar named Asiya. Like many kings and those of royal blood, King Asiya was very wealthy and powerful. Despite that, he didn't own any slaves, at least not any human slaves. Instead, he would call upon animals to aid his people with their work. But he wanted to make sure that the work was being done quickly and efficiently, and so it was communicated properly to all the animals. So he decided he would appoint the chief head for all the different kinds of animals. These creatures would be referred to as kings, but this just sounds like middle management to me. First, he declared the elephant would be the king of the forest beasts. Then, he appointed the hippopotamus to be the king of the water animals. Lastly, he thought about the king of the birds. He thought deeply about this and mulled over many ways to decide who was best suited for the role. It really does seem like the king was able to choose the forest beasts and the water animals as no-brainers, but I kind of agree with him that the birds would be harder than those two. I think elephants make the most sense just because they look so wise, and I would personally choose elephants over lions any day as the kings of kind of like the jungles and savannas and forests. Hippos, again, I think they're quite obvious just because they're so scary looking and they are so quick and so fast in the water. A lot quicker, I think, than most other animals. But with birds, it's just like, what animal, like, how do you describe the king of the birds? Is it the quickest bird? Is it the one that can fly the highest, the biggest, the one that eats the most? Because I feel like it doesn't, there's no criteria really for which bird you think of when you think of king bird. Except, you know, if you're American and you think of the bald eagle right away. The rest of us don't really do that. Yeah, I really am into... uh finding out how movies were made and stuff. And so they were talking about one movie, how like there was an eagle cawing or whatever. And they're like, yeah, we actually used like a hawk, hawk's cry because the eagle's cry is just not nearly as intimidating. And I just love this idea that the bald eagle is supposed to be this very terrifying thing, but its cry is like, and they were like, we need a different animal to make the sound. It's not working out, guys. We've all been duped. It's also like how lion noises in... The Lion King is just like a guy in a studio, like banging things around with a trash can to make that lion roar, not actually a lion's roar. I feel like nature documentaries really have just opened my eyes towards what animals really are like. 
Because mm-hmm. personally, I like I've I don't know about you, but I've never really seen most of the animals except in zoos, and then they're not really talking um, or like making noises. <laughs> they just kind of hang out. So when you see them in nature documentaries and they're in their natural habitat and they're kind of left alone and they make certain noises, it's always so confusing to me because I just I can't put together the idea of what the animal should sound like based on movies I've seen with the actual sound they make. <laughs> yeah. That's just my opinion. And also, I think the largest bird in the African continent, I think, is the ostrich, if I'm not wrong. And so I can't really... <laughs> like, can you imagine the ostrich being the king of the birds when it can't fly? It's just... It's a little bit silly. <laughs> it's a little bit silly, a little bit sad, um, but... You know, how else are we supposed to decide this? Uh, it's it's hard to think about. But yeah, it does seem like the elephant and the hippo kind of got the monopoly on, on their categories already. Like, they got that reputation. And now the birds have to duke it out. <laughs> with that said, like, if we can't just go with the ostrich, we're going to have to figure out another way to do this. Um, and the king was just going through all these birds. He's, there's so many to consider. There's the the swift hawk, the graceful heron, the spur-winged geese, the great hornbill, the colorful toucan, and that's not to mention any of the game birds. And this king must have been seriously into birds, too, because he just kind of contemplated more of them. He would just continue to list some of the different options that he had, uh, thinking of, like, cranes, black and white fishing eagles, uh, pelicans, doves, and many lesser-known forest birds. All these birds had sent their claims to the king, but he was just left feeling confused. So, after much creative thinking, he decided to have a trial by combat. The most creative trial, to be sure. (laughs) Uh, But, you know, makes for good entertainment. So, the very next morning, thousands of birds gathered to fight. Remember, the reward is to be king of the birds, which is just a glorified management position really but returning to the fight there was much screeching as the battle commenced the hawk tribe started strongly quickly driving out the smaller forest birds and then relentlessly pursuing the loud geese who panically left uh, the area honking at one another many of the big forest birds got irritated by all the noise and quietly left the game birds quickly surrendered and hid shaking in a bush Then there were the scavenger birds who were ferocious looking, but they were quite lazy and just kind of ate throughout the whole trial, not really paying much attention. Some birds continued to fight high in the sky, pecking and clawing at one another as blood and feathers flew every which way. Finally, the fishing eagle spoke. When you are all done with this foolishness, do let me know. And if any of you still feel that you should be head chief, Come, and I'll show you how wrong you are. He said this, bearing his cruel claws. The rest of the birds took in his imposing stature, knowing of his power and ferocity. The birds stopped their fighting and acknowledged the fishing eagle as their master. The king then named the eagle Etuan and declared that he would be king of the birds. From that day onward, Young men would take three black and white feathers from the king bird and tie it to their hair when they went off to fight. One feather would be tied to each side of their head, and the last would be down the middle. It's believed the feathers would grant the wearer courage and skill, but if youth did not possess this for the fight, he would be looked upon as nothing but a boy. And that is the tale of the election of the bird king. I like it. I like that the the last bird that becomes king doesn't really have to work for it, which is nepotism. <laughs> I'm kidding. I don't want to, you know, tell the fishing eagle that he didn't do his job. But I did look up a picture of the fishing eagle and it didn't look like what I thought it should look like. Because in my head, I imagined this like fantastical, like big kind of bird. Um, just because if you're going to be a threat to the other birds, you would imagine something that's quite bigger than the rest of them. But it looks kind of average. So... All the power to the fishing eagle for just being confident enough to take the position. But I do like the end, the tie-in, that it becomes something that the boys would wear as a signal, kind of like a rite of passage to becoming men. 
because um, mm-hmm. those are often really fun stories to hear about, rites of passage. I think we did a couple rites of passage stories in the past, and they're always so interesting to see what the transition is and what creatures, what dances, what songs, what kind of elements go into making that transition from childhood to adulthood. So it's interesting that it's the eagle, like the bird, the king of the birds, that becomes that as opposed to the elephant or the hippo. Mm. All that more special. Yeah, that's true. Well, it's not like you can take, you know, the tusk or like there's no feathers on an elephant or a hippo. Like there's not really much to take from them. Maybe an eye. <laughs> the poachers would disagree. <laughs> this this is true. The entire ivory black market would disagree. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I I walked into that one. That's true. Um, <laughs> but that's not good. That's not right. Um, getting back to the birds that we're talking about here. It's interesting. If you kind of go through the story, it's they give all these different reasons of why each bird doesn't really qualify. Like some are easily scared, so they just like give up and hide in a bush. Or they're driven out by like bully birds. Or they just don't like the noise of it all, so they leave. Um, And some could be a threat, but they're just, like, too lazy to go for it. So it's kind of an interesting, also, allegory. Is allegory the right word? Analogy. Mm -hmm. For why maybe some people kind of end up where they are. um, Or why some people don't uh, maybe end up in positions where they are. Because it's just, like, there's different forces around you or different personality types that might not be a good fit. Mm-hmm. That said, that the role of king has historically been something you're born into, so I don't feel like it's a good analogy for that king role. But that's not the only story we have today, so why don't we head on over to our next tale, the tale of the elephant and the tortoise, or why the worms are blind, and why the elephant has small eyes. Lots to cover in this one story. Oof, yes. I am a big fan of long titles. If you ever see an episode with a really stupid long title, there's a good chance I was the one picking it out because I just get drawn to those. Remember how the last story focused on a king from Calabar? Well, this story also references a king from Calabar, but this story occurs when a man named Ambo was king. During this time, the elephant was not only a very large animal, but also had big eyes in proportion to its massive body. I'm personally picturing, like, those big, sparkling anime eyes. (laughs) (laughs) And King Ambo regularly threw lots of feasts during this time and invited many of the animals, like the elephant. And the elephant would come, and he would eat more than anyone else. Sometimes the hippopotamus would get ambitious and try to out-eat the elephant, but that always ended poorly for him. The small, cunning tortoise saw how much the elephant was eating. He thought, It was rude that he ate more than his fair share and decided that someone should teach him a lesson. The very next day, the tortoise went out and got the elephant's favorite foods of dry palm kernels and shrimps. So this is even doubly interesting because the elephants are, well, elephants are herbivores, so they only really eat plants. So either this elephant is eating the shrimp just to kind of make a point (laughs) <laughs> or this story is kind of about why the elephant stopped eating shrimp and seafood altogether. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of my take, just because I feel like elephants are just known to be massive herbivores. So it's interesting that in this story, they specifically mention shrimp. I think that sounds about right. There's no real reason for the elephant to suddenly eat shrimp, um, but the, the apparently it's his favorite, and the tortoise knows this, and he was able to get his hands on it. All of those things, pretty incredible, but, you know, (laughs) the story must go on. (laughs) He put the food in his satchel, and he went to the elephant's house. The elephant invites him in and tells his guests to make himself comfortable. So, the tortoise sits down, closes one eye, and pulls out one palm kernel and one shrimp and begins to eat. The elephant looked longingly at the food and asked what the tortoise was eating. The tortoise turned to the elephant, keeping one eye tightly shut. He said that what he was eating was very sweet, but also very painful, because he was eating his own eye. But the elephant wasn't disturbed by this revelation. 
In fact, he told the tortoise if it was that good, then he would like to remove one of his eyes and feed it to him. The tortoise grinned to himself, for this is what he had planned for. Pulling out a knife, he tells the elephant that he is so small that he won't be able to reach the elephant's eye. So, the elephant picks up the tortoise with his mighty trunk and raises him up. The moment the tortoise gets close enough, he jabs the sharp knife in and scoops out the right eye. The elephant cried out in pain, but the tortoise quickly fed him the kernels and the shrimp. The elephant enjoyed the food so much that he quickly forgot his pain. My question is, if the palm kernels and the shrimp are the elephant's favorite food, why doesn't he recognize that this isn't his eye, but this is actually just his favorite food? I thought this was quite interesting, just because I feel like when you think of elephants, you usually think of wise, clever animals, and time and time again, they do show off this cleverness. So for the elephant to fall for the tortoise's trick is a bit interesting. Um, Specifically just because I feel like the tortoise is often called a trickster animal. But for me, even for me, even for the tricksters, I feel like this is very far into the kind of almost horror realm of trickstery. Yeah. And not, you know, like the jackal in the spring where we did and that was a bit more fun trickstery. This is kind of a bit much with the body mutilation. (laughs) But to each their own. I mean, some tricksters like to trick you into falling for a bad deal or or for a scam. And others make you eat your own eye. So to each their own, I guess. Wow, yeah. The the tortoise knew it was getting to spooky season and was like, I choose violence, I guess. (laughs) It's like, ah, the horror movies that are out recently, not that great. Let me make my own. I'm going to show them what real horror is. Maybe the elephant got its reputation for being wise after this because it learned not to trust people. Maybe. Yeah, maybe this is like the middle arc of the elephant. We just haven't seen where he's where he ends up. So soon after this, the elephant exclaimed that the food was so yummy and sweet that he must have more. The tortoise told him that he would give him more, but the other eye must be removed first. The food must have been that good because the elephant agrees and the tortoise gouges out the elephant's left eye. Then the tortoise slid down the trunk and found a place to hide. The elephant trumpeted in pain and stomped around searching for the tortoise. But of course, the elephant was now blind with no eyes, so he could not find the hidden tortoise. The next morning, the elephant went outside but had to ask what the time was for he could not see a thing. After some awkward conversations of animals passing by, the elephant realized that he had been tricked by the tortoise. So he began asking the other animals if he could borrow their eyes so he could see for a bit. Surprisingly, nobody was eager or even willing to lend their eyes because they were all being used. It's at this point that a worm passes by the elephant. The elephant addresses the worm and asks if he could borrow the worm's eyes for a few days. The worm is flattered that the king of the forest beasts would address him. That's right. This story canonically takes place after the election of the birds. We don't have many uh, stories or folklore that are related to other folklore like so directly Mm -hmm. like this. So I found this to be a really cool moment. That's like chronological. Yeah, exactly. The worm was so flattered that he agreed to lend the elephant his eyes until the next market day. Now, I'm not sure if you know this, but worms are very small creatures and especially tiny compared to an elephant. So the eyes that the worm gave were also quite small. But when the elephant placed the tiny eyes in his giant eye sockets, flesh closed in tightly around it. And when the next market day came about, The elephant couldn't get the eyes out to return it to the worm. So instead of communicating this to the worm, he decides to ignore him. The worm would repeatedly submit requests for his eyes to be returned, but the elephant would pretend that he couldn't hear despite his huge ears. And sometimes when the worm was making his request, the elephant would loudly say that he hoped no worms were about, for his eyes were so small that he might not see them and accidentally squish them. And that is why worms are blind and elephants have tiny eyes. 
<laughs> so in fact, the tortoise's lesson to the elephant wasn't really a lesson since he found a way around it. Yes, but I think with the, the tiny eyes implies that his vision's still not as good. Mm-hmm. Though I think elephants still have pretty good vision. Um, they just don't have huge anime eyes anymore. I guess in proportion to like the rest of their face, their eyes are quite small. So that's why you would have a story about this. I just think that, you know, the elephant was supposed to learn a lesson and all he learned was to lie. Poor worm. Or not to trust tortoises. You might be like, have a thing against them now. I do like how every different region has their own trickster animal. Of course, we have the fox that everyone knows about from European folklore. We have spiders. We have jackals and tortoises and sometimes even hares. They play the tortoise role. Um, so the tortoise is sometimes a trickster, but other times it's the hare that's a trickster. All in all, the trickster animals, they are jerks. And there are things that I cannot say on this podcast because they would need to be bleeped out. Um, and so I do feel sympathy for the other animals. In this case, though, it is such a weird, like, it's such a weird punishment he devises. But the elephant is stupid for falling for it. And then the worm is kind of just a bystander who gets caught in the problem as well. So it's hard to not feel, you know, some kind of guilt about what the worm does because he wasn't meant to be tortured or he wasn't meant to lose his eyes. Um, But in general, I do like trickster stories. I don't know if this one's my favorite, but I like (laughs) how it addresses multiple things. It just goes, this is why the elephant has small eyes. This is why the worm can't see. And this is why the tortoise is still a jerk. And no one invites to their feasts or their parties. It's also just a funny punishment because, like, I don't know how much this elephant was eating. But, like, it, just based on their size alone, of course the elephant is going to eat way more than a tortoise. Like, it's going to just require more because it's such a massive animal. <laughs> so mm-hmm. there's a part of me that just wonders if the elephant is just eating just the right amount for himself, but the tortoise doesn't like that he can eat more and hippos eat quite a lot as well so i I don't hear any hippo slander around here but he's not as eating as much as the uh the elephant also they're king of their respective categories (laughs) so of course they're gonna like push people around a little bit more and stuff so i don't know why the tourist is surprised by all this (laughs) no neither do i but at least it gives us a reason for two different like explanatory folktales of course so we have two different explanations for two different things So, speaking of worms, (laughs) this is so random, but... No, I want to hear it. Okay, there was... So, I was reading a news, like a news article about these invasive worms that apparently they track down regular earthworms. You know, the worms that aren't hurting anybody. They track them down and they kill them (gasps) and then they... They kind of, I think I, it was, a, I was a bit confused about the description, but they kind of use their bodies to lure birds down. And then when the birds eat them, they basically eat the birds from the inside out. <gasps> what? And if you kill, like if you step on them, th- like it won't kill them. So you have to literally put them in a bag and like suffocate them. Oh my gosh. It's like this invasive worm and apparently like a hammerhead worm. And they are, like, it sounds like it's a, it's from a creature from a weird sci-fi movie. Yeah. Yeah, if you, if you chop them into bits, they will regenerate into complete worms. And they're currently... Well, that's what normal worms do. Yeah, but, like, these ones are insane worms. Like, they are psychopath worms, if psychopaths could be worms. Are they, like, a growing problem? Or are they just a thing that exists? Well, apparently they're a growing problem um, because they're invasive. So they're not supposed to be there. And if they're going after earthworms, then that's a really big problem because earthworms are essential for the ecosystem. Um, But... Dang. And, like, obviously it says, like, they're unusual. um, And, you know, they tend... Like, I feel like some of it obviously is hyped up fear, of course. Um, and like some of it is like, you know, hyped up like, oh, it's scary or like TikToks that say this creature, stay away from it or this is how you can kill it. But it's just, it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit scary. Ooh, okay. I looked at a photo. Yeah. Of one. Yikes. I, I'm a little afraid to look at one. Is it, 
It doesn't look like just a worm? It's like a weird worm. Okay, I'm not looking at it. Are we going to put one on the website? Please tell me No, probably not. not. Okay, you will be safe if you go on our website. Uh, that is talesofthechanforest.com. You will not see any of these hammerhead worms. No, because I, I will have to look at them to put them on the website, and I don't like doing that, so that's not something I will be doing. No. Um, but I just, I didn't no. know that worms could be scary. Like, I thought worms were quite cute and friendly, and, you know, you're not supposed to really bother them because they they're cute? just doing... Well, not cute, obviously, but I don't know if you had to do this in, in kin- like, not kindergarten, but, like, in elementary school, we had to take care of an earthworm. After a rainfall, we had to go get them, and then we had to, like, we put them in little, like, petri dis- dishes, and we just kind of, like, looked at them for a bit. We took care of them for a week, and then we returned them back into the wild, just as part of our ecosystems unit, I think. Yeah, I've never had to deal with worms before, so that's, um... <laughs> I never had to do that. (laughs) I try not to. I try not to, like, freak out. I try... I'm trying to be a bit more generous with the animal, like, the insects around me. The only ones that I don't... I will never be okay with are mosquitoes. But everything else... And flies. But everything else, I'm kind of like, okay, you serve a function. Just because you came into my space and don't pay rent doesn't mean I have the right to kill you. I just have to (laughs) trap you and, like, send you on your way. Um, And with earthworms specifically, like, you could not find a better like a friendlier insect that's just trying to save the world and do its job you know worm poop excellent i know so it's like hating bees how could you hate bees they're just doing an essential function that we need to survive we should leave them alone um and this kind of comes up to the next thing i wanted to talk about and it's just the more we talk about these animal tales and the more you know we listen to stories about animals and animal folklore and explanatory tales about animals it almost makes me question how many of these are going to become myths in the future um Mm. you know given the rate of extinction of different animals and given how you know their their natural habitats are being destroyed and even with nigeria's birth the crowned crane it's kind of like the amount of space they're losing and the overhunting all of that has led to them becoming endangered and then that's the same for most animals so you know hippos elephants I don't know about the fishing eagle, but probably the fishing eagle. It's just a reality in our everyday life that with global warming, but also with the expansion of cities and the loss of natural habitats for these creatures, it does make me wonder in the future, will we even know what an elephant is? Or is it going to be something that exists in textbooks and maybe a couple in a zoo or through a kind of like um, rehabilitation program that's just in zoos or in conservation centers? So... It's something to just think about. It's like when we talk about animal stories, obviously they're long-term stories that have come from people from the past who've shared it along and then we are telling it now. But will these stories someday become myths? It's kind of like with mammoths and with saber-toothed lions and with dodo birds. Like at what point do these creatures, are the creatures that we see now every day, what, at what point are they going to join that list? And the people in the future are going to be like, ah, oh, have you heard about the crazy elephants? It's wild that those animals actually existed um so just something to you know think about a sad note to end off the episode is just thinking about the impact we have and how these stories are preservation for a lot of cultures but now they're also preservation for birds and for animals that we might not have in the future so just the importance of storytelling yeah so sometimes we take away like lessons from these stories which are like you know be nice to people um (laughs) you know or tell the truth. And sometimes it's like, hey, global climate change is happening and humans are overhunting, so maybe we need to stop that. <laughs> um, we just need to be aware of our actions in the world. But on that note, uh, thank you, dear travelers, for joining us. So travelers, this is a new format that we are trying out. If you have any thoughts, any opinions that you'd like to share with us, you can always reach us on our Gmail account. So talesfromthechanforest at gmail.com. You can send us a little email, but we are also available on Twitter, now known as X, and Blue Sky with the username from Enchanted. And we are also on TikTok and Instagram at Tales from the Enchanted Forest, although we are going to be making more of an effort to be active on those sites. Um, otherwise, be sure to send us any messages you have, suggestions, or if there are any stories you would like to hear. And remember... There's always a place for you. 
in the Enchanted Forest.